Hey, it's Jessica Damasa with WTF Health. I am here with Mike McSherry. He is the co-founder of Zelf, and he is also a serial entrepreneur who has founded, this is company number six, very successful startups, including being the co-founder of Boost Mobile and Swipe, the keyboard app that people may know and love on their Android device, right? Correct. So welcome, it's good to talk to you. Thank you, Jessica. And so you've lost your mind and you've come into healthcare. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're trying a healthcare startup. My, same team. I've been loyal, working with the same group of people for 15, 20 years. Okay, so, so I love talking to entrepreneurs, especially very successful entrepreneurs. And though, although you did say that you did have a company that didn't do well, and we'll come back to that. But before we do, I want to talk about Zelf. No, you're on the hot seat now. <laughs> I want to talk about Zelf. And you've described this as a digital health formulary. And I think that this is just brilliant, especially with all of the um, different applications that are kind of being pushed through. And that there is like some measure now with the FDA, like an FDA approve certain things to kind of make sense of all of this stuff. And so I think having something like this in place might help do that. So talk a little bit about what it is and what you hope to accomplish. Sure. So Zelf is a, a platform that lets doctors or clinicians prescribe digital assets to patients. And that's articles, videos, uh, apps, programs, devices, even lift rides and meal delivery, e-com products. So all of this can get prescribed in a clinical care environment within the EMR workflow. So same as prescribing medications. Okay. We flow it through to the patients for them to engage with it more readily. And then we track the patient's utilization against all of that. So where are they at in week 12 of a weight loss program? What's their behavioral health screening say on a weekly basis? What's their CPAP machine reading on a nightly usage basis? And since we're pulling all that back into the clinical workflow, we can alert the clinicians when thresholds aren't met or interventions are necessary. And then in aggregate, we're studying all of these things against patient segments so we know which apps, programs, pathways work best against patient segmentations for the next prescribing recommendation algorithm to work against that. Okay, so I know you're already up, operational, and working. So talk to me about how it's working. So you guys are in some hospital systems, and you've got a nicely sized seed round that you've been funded by. So t t I mean, but talk about that, because that's an unusual place to start, and this is a massive challenge that you're taking on, and so I want to make sure that people understand that this is like really legit. So talk to me. Sure, so Providence St. Joseph, uh, I think they're a top three, four system in the country, hired my executive team from Swipe as entrepreneurs and residents, four of us. Zero background in healthcare, but they've like, you guys have been clever in other industries, do something in healthcare. So we saw all the problems, we saw all these billions invest in digital health solutions, but they had typically been selling it to the payer or the employer. As they went to the provider, they weren't integrated the workflow, doctors were asked to right. work outside of their Epic or Cerner environments and just didn't, you know, synthesize them with that. So we built it into the prescribing workflow in an elegant way. We, we were Prov employees, we had access to the uh, Epic Development Toolkit. And so we launched that at Providence. Uh, UPMC saw what we were doing and they said, hey, if you can share this working in our Epic environment, we want to invest in this and spin it out as a separate independent company. So last year, June, we spun out, raised money from our first four hospital customers. And so now we're live against all those systems and we've launched others and we've signed other systems. But uh, we're in front of thousands of clinicians, doctors, nurses, MAs. Uh, we have either prescribed or monitored hundreds of thousands of utilizations against individual patients. Okay. And that's like articles or you know enrolling patients in specific programs or a pathway of pre-op, post-op information or monitoring tens of thousands of CPAP patients or uh, all oncology patients and survivorship okay. plans. So it's a broad range of digital services and so we quote digital health formulary. It's whatever the clinicians think is relevant to the patient care and in today's environment when you have social determinant, you know, risk-based exposure, yeah. that could constitute transportation needs, uh, we're doing meal delivery for post-op recovery, so you name the type of digital service that benefits a patient and we can integrate it into our platform. I am so fascinated with this and I love the fact that you guys are making some real impact on the way people are consuming different types of uh, like health information and, and and different health services in order to like help them achieve whatever it is that they're trying to achieve. If it's managing a chronic condition or if it's just getting yep. to be great more well. I'm curious to know on the other side of this, you talked a lot about the patients and the providers, but I'm curious to know on the payment side of this, are you, what are your plans there? Because I mean, you're talking to me and I'm like, if they're prescribing this stuff, does this mean that there might be a diagnosis code for Zelf in the future? Like, how is this going to upend the payment model? Like, what's the vision there? There's got to be something. So we've integrated over 20 different digital vendors. And I would say the bulk of them have been paid for by the providers. We, 
we license our technology to providers. And some of that is for patient ed, which hits quality or meaningful use. Uh, some of it is care pathways of pre-op, post-op information that might affect readmits or you know quality scores. Uh, some of it, lift rides, are against Medicaid surgical patients because they have a high no-show rate. So better to pay a $20 lift ride than have a right. $20,000 lost or a booking slot. Uh, we're a cloud plugin to the EMR, and that enables us to look at all the EMR data that helps in a filtering algorithm. You know, what might be appropriate for a patient with this lab result and this demographic condition and this disease state. Uh, but then as a cloud plugin, we can also marry up to payer employer eligibility. So we've launched Omada and Weight Watchers, the first two payer filtered apps. Okay. So that's only going to be shown to a clinician as a recommended treatment for this patient, A, if they're clinically eligible against A1C and BMI, and B, if there's a payer employer eligibility that matches up against that. And we see that side of the business growing quite a bit further. I mean, for sure. I mean, that's really where this is headed, right? I mean, because I think that there's so many digital health apps out there, or digital solutions out there. There's not even just apps. I right. mean, just digital solutions, and somebody needs to make sense of it. So this is really inspiring. Yeah, and especially as we're capturing all the aggregate patient utilization uh, on engagement and then ultimately on outcome, that's going to become incredibly valuable. And of our six, seven customer contracts, all have been willing to share aggregate data uh, into a common pool so, uh, on an anonymized basis yeah. so they can see what other programs are working for patients. And I think especially in chronic care management, you're not going to find a one-size-fits-all. Right. Things are going to segment that this works best for this ethnicity, this works best for women, this works best for seniors. And because of the flexibility of our platform, I can plug in three, five, ten different solutions, no skin off my back, but then you'll marry them up as to what's going to be most relevant for that patient in front of the clinician. And that's really what matters. Correct. Right. So I want to know, I mean, like, I love that you're not from healthcare. It's like, thank God. <laughs> okay, so yeah. talk to me about how bad healthcare is. No, I'm joking. Talk, talk to me about just the challenges, I guess, of healthcare. And I have a lot of entrepreneurs that will watch. And I'd like to get your advice. You know, as somebody who's done, who's, who's founded and scaled and raised and sold multiple companies, what's your best advice for a startup in healthcare in particular? So of those six startups I've done, every single one of them was either a joint venture or the first money I raised was from strategics. And so I knew nothing about healthcare. I, I learned from the inside. I, you know, I was a Providence employee. They okay. told me all the problems. They gave me access to all resources, all research data. So I learned from the inside. So first off, I think healthcare is so big and segmented and complex that you need to find that big brother, that benefactor that's going to help aid and assist you. And you might be selling into the payer space, you might be in the pharma space, you might be in the you know corporate wellness employee space. Find that big brother that's really going to validate you, champion you, be a referral source, put you on platform, put you on stage against those different opportunities. And I found that with Prov and UPMC especially. So yeah. that's first and foremost, is find that validity, that referenceability, that clinicians, that or, or pay your entity or whatever that's going to advocate and, and drive you. Uh, second, humble, you know, learn. I, I was c new coming in. Yeah. Healthcare is so vast, you can't know everything. So go in with a humble approach and, and have people hopefully aid in a, a Everybody wants to improve patient care. I'm finding that healthcare is the least competitive environment I've been in. You know, I was in the really? mobile, well, yeah. you know, I mean, cutthroat that's Apple, first, Samsung, right? you know, et cetera. Um, you know, Samsung, AT&T, uh, AT Verizon, go head to head. In healthcare, it's more collaborative. So you find people willing to assist you because we're all working towards the benefit of patient care and reducing costs and, you know, the, the triple aim, quadruple aim, however you define that. So my advice would be, you know, find that partner that's going to work with you learn, be voracious at it, and then just incrementally improve your product and service to meet the needs for, you know, your solution. And I know, I mean, you had mentioned to me that you did have a company that did go bust. So can, I, I want to bring this painful memory up for you. and sure. see. No, but I really, what I would like is I, I think it's really important for entrepreneurs to not only learn about the successes, but also to learn from the failures, right? So talk to me about that. What did you learn and what happened and what was the takeaway? So, well, let me go back. I co-founded Boost Mobile in Australia, brought it again to the U.S. and co-founded Boost Mobile, and Boost has been a raging success, $5 billion a year in revenue. Amazing. Uh, same team tried Amped Mobile. Uh, different time, different era, slightly different business model. We ended up raising $400 million, and we had Intel and Qualcomm and Verizon and Motorola and hedge funds and MTV and Universal Music all as investors. Yeah. 400 million gone. Oh. Uh, it, it hurt. <laughs> 
but but telecom is also such a big space right, that right. you you have people making these multi hundred million dollar billion dollar bets. You don't think what the satellites learn? in this guy. What did you learn from this? Uh, humble. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it's humbling. That's where uh, that advice came from. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, so twofold. I, you know, definitely you you learn from from your failures and mistakes, right? Yeah. You know, I'm a well, different yeah, person I mean, from it. Uh, I also learned the spirit of entrepreneurialism that I bounced back from that. I'm a CEO of Swipe, and that was put on a billion devices, and we sold yeah. the company successfully. And so you'll see a lot of investors willing to fund risk takers as long as they're thoughtful, they've learned, they're not going to make the same mistakes, they're going at things in a different manner. Yeah. And um, so I've been successful five out of six startups, one big failure, but still I'm successful to the point of... Uh, we were trying to change the world. It's just wrong time, wrong place. Oh, now you're trying to change healthcare, so no big deal. <laughs> no, but again, like like telecom, it's a massive industry, yeah. and you bring a, a credible solution to the market, then it's a big opportunity to grow a company. But I, I'm not in this for the financial return in that I had a little more mission focus. I had some flexibility on where I wanted to spend my time, and I thought that attacking some problems in healthcare would be meaningful for my team and I. And we have, uh, my company has 38 employees, I think 16 or 17 are ex-Swipe, so a loyal group yeah. following to do yet another mission on something that we all think is good. All right, well, good luck on your mission. We hope it's accomplished. <laughs> Terrible thing to say, but it's true. Um, no, and truly, we're happy to have the outside perspectives into healthcare, and I really think that the, the um, approach that you're taking is very forward-thinking, and I'm excited to see what happens. So we'll keep our eye on self, okay. see how it goes. Thanks so much for joining no, me. It's a pleasure much, to Jessica. talk to you. I'm Jessica Damasa here at Health 2.0 for WTFL. Thanks for joining us.